Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the September 2020 CDA Vendor Webinar. My name is Ahmed Tahir, and I will be presenting along with my colleagues, Dan Pollock, Melissa Mujik, Amy Webb, Heather DeVendris, and Wendy Wise. We will be presenting primarily CDA-related information that applies to the 2020 release 9.5 and some future updates which will apply for 2021, 2021 and beyond. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the NHSN CDA submission support portal. We do have a lot to present, so let's get started with Dan Pollock. Thank you, Ahmed. And let me add to Ahmed's welcome uh, my own. Uh, and we're very grateful for your attention this afternoon or morning, if it's still morning where you are. We know these are difficult times. Uh, we're continuing to do all we can to support the COVID-19 response as well as continuing to do our pre-COVID work on NHSN, which continues through uh, the pandemic and will continue beyond the pandemic. So as Ahmed said, we do have quite a lot to cover, beginning with updates, uh, turning to the COVID-19 module, uh, discussing the patient safety component, uh, AUR module, the work that we're continuing to do on synthetic data sets, vocabulary, dialysis, biovigilance, neonatal, our vendor services, uh, some other topics, and then of course, your questions and our efforts to respond to them. Next slide, Ahmed. So uh, in general terms, uh, we do continue to have one major software release a year in which the changes include NHSN surveillance protocol changes that are reflected in the software release, we transition to new CDA versions on account of protocol changes, and those changes go into effect uh, January 1st of each year. So we wanna keep the reporting uh, with the changes uh, in a calendar year basis. Makes it much easier on our side, on the NHSN side, uh, to analyze and report out the data. We do have non-major releases, and these can include uh, new components uh, major ch minor change requests, defect resolutions, as well as uh, infrastructure maintenance and support for NHSM. So this is uh, all uh, in keeping with what we've done in the past and we're continuing to uh, follow this pattern. Ahmed, back to you. Oh, let me do one last slide, which is our release schedule, uh, as Ahmed indicated. Uh, it 9.5 is scheduled for December. Uh, defects will be effective uh, post deployment. Uh, and uh, uh, CRs will, uh, change requests will be effective January 1st, uh, 2021. Release 10.0 is scheduled for the next summer and it's going to include the new neonatal component at last, which was moved original from its original release date uh, earlier this year. Now I'm in back to you. Thanks, Dan. All right, next slide, please. Um, I'll start with new updates to our COVID module. Um, as many of you are aware, the hospital-related COVID data is no longer being reported to NHSN. Um, it is now being sent directly to HHS, HHS Protect since mid-July. We are still accepting data from long-term care facilities. Uh, the link here will take you to the website where you can find the latest CSV files and table of instructions to submit uh, COVID data for long-term care. Um, in addition, users can now submit their CSV files via direct. This is only for COVID submissions. Um, you can reach out to the NHSN or CDA inbox for questions on how to submit via direct. We will have a guidance document posted on the website soon. Uh, next slide. The next update we plan to release for COVID will be for outpatient dialysis pathway. Currently, we have this scheduled for late next month, October 2020, um, but that is subject to change. When requirements come out, they will be shared with vendors and posted on the website. Next slide. All right, next are updates for patient safety release 9.5 and 10.0. Um, as mentioned with Dan, release 9.5 is scheduled for December 2020 and release uh, 10.0 will be for summer 2021. Starting with defects, that will be corrected in 9.5. Defect 8683 was allowing a CDA file with an incorrect drug to be saved instead of giving an error message to make corrections. 
the following two defects do not have any CDA implications. Defect 9165 was occurring only on the UI when an SSI file linked to KPRO procedure, the ICD-10 code field becomes disabled. Defect 9269 will correct the ICD-10 codes to be accepted on import and not show an error message. Next slide. Next, we will discuss a new change request. CR 2036 removes urinary system infection, USI, from UTI specific events. USI will be its own event and will be manual entry only. CDA will no longer work for USI. CR 2263 updates the UTI event criteria for fever. Fever will now be applicable for all ages. CR 2458 is to improve data collection for lines two and three, patient days and admissions for MDRO denominator. These lines should include all patients housed on select inpatient units. Next slide. CR 2456 is an update to all HAI pathogen susceptibility on the data collection forms. Some drugs will be removed and some new drugs will be added to the susceptibility collection, as well as a change in the result value options for existing drugs. This updated list will only be for dates equal to or greater than 2021. I will cover the IDM updates for this CR in the next couple of slides. This CR affects dialysis, patient safety, and long-term care. CR 2460 is to tighten CLIP rules for patients less than four months old. Contraindication will not be selectable prior to entering the date of birth and date of insertion. CR 2457 is based on new CMS guidelines. NHSN will allow inclusion of IRF and IPF units, which were previously not allowed from specific NHSN facility types. Next slide. CR 2364 is for the annual pathogen code list update. This year, there are minimal changes to the pathogen list. Just be sure to use the correct list based on the date of event. Um, and you can see here, we've uh, versioned our pathogen list code to make it. And as mentioned for CR 2456, this slide reflects the IDM update. Updates the ATI pathogen susceptibility on the data collection forms. In the left screenshot of the pathogen, in the left screenshot, the pathogen 2021 tab, we have added columns which represent which anti-B panel is being used. There are three columns to show if the update is for patient safety, long-term care, or dialysis. The screenshot on the right shows the new anti-B 9.5 updates. There will be two anti-B tabs now. One will be for events prior to 2021 and one will be used for events greater than 2021. Uh, we version the, the 9.5 um, anti-B tab as anti-B underscore 9.5. The green color all indicate new changes that are made. Next slide. CR 2742 is scheduled to be included next year in release 10.0. The following HAI events will have a new COVID question included. SSI, BSI, UTI, and VAE. The question will ask if patient has COVID, and if the answer is yes, select either confirmed or suspected. This field is currently available in the UI and is optional. The CDA will be updated to R3N version in the CDA 9.5 toolkits. We've Over some vocabulary updates. NHSN will be moving all value sets from the HAI VOC document, which is provided with all IDs, and will be moving to VSAC. If you have any questions or would like to know more about VSAC, please reach out to Sheila Abner at the email listed here. Additionally, on our CSSP webpage, we will have a link for NHSN terminology. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa. Hello, um, I'm just going to discuss the releases for remdesivir. Um, in release 946, the team added a requirement to include remdesivir as a required drug in the AU files beginning with July 2020 and forward. This update, however, resulted in two defects. 
the first defect was that files containing remdesivir were failing to import when being submitted via direct CDA automation. This defect was numbered 9384 and it was resolved and released 948. The second defect was that if there were errors with the AU files containing remdesivir, the wrong error message was displayed. This defect was 9414 and it was resolved and released 949. Um, please let us know if you have any further questions regarding any of these issues or defects. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, I am Amy Webb, another uh, subject matter expert for the AUR module, and I'm going to talk first about the NHSN uh, 9.5 AUR module updates that are scheduled for December. So the first main change to cover is for the AU option. We've updated some drugs uh, for 2021, so we'll be adding four new drugs listed here on the slide and then removing three drugs. So this slide shows the summary of the last four years of changes that we've made. So as you remember for 2020, we added seven new drugs, including the mid-year addition of remdesivir that Melissa just mentioned, and removed six. So for 2021, we're going to continue that pattern of adding and removing if necessary. So we'll be adding the four new drugs and removing the three. I did want to point out that amphotericin B lipid complex, as well as colistin, which was added for 2020, um, are not newly approved FDA drugs, but instead we're adding them as separate drugs for AU option because they do have separate RX norm codes. So we'd like to be able to capture them separately to make sure they are in fact being captured. So this next item is a defect within the antimicrobial ingredients 2020 and antimicrobial ingredients 2021 tabs within the IDM. We actually removed lithromycin and tigerstillin with clavulon 8 from the AR option drug panels in 2019, but these drugs are still incorrectly appearing in the 2020 and 2021 AR option drug panels within those tabs of the IDM. So this defect will just clean up those two IDM tabs and remove the X's within the AR option drug panels for the rows associated with those two drugs. So those two drugs should not be included in any AR submissions for 2020 forward. The next update is a 9.5 change to the AR option. This is simply updating the maximum value accepted for the MIC, E-test, and KB test values to 9,999.99. This will allow vendors to report the actual value reported by the lab if it's greater than 999.99, which is our current max. One large change we're making for the AR option for 2021 is related to our pathogens. Our goal for 2021 is to obtain a more complete picture of the pathogens that are identified that fit within our AR option protocol and to provide more standardized guidance for reporting. So with that, we will continue to use the pathogen codes tab in the IDM like you use right now and you are all familiar with. We will be adding 41 new pathogens to the ARO pathogen column within that tab, um, as noted by the X added to the column with the green. These specific SNOMED codes will be accepted into NHSN, so you can use those specific codes within your AR events. Uh, when you review the Pathogen Codes 2021 tab, you'll see that these there are 41 new Xs. Some are preferred terms and some are synonyms, so it's not quite 41 new SNOMED codes, just 41 new rows um, that have Xs. What will be brand new for 2021 is that we will expect facilities to report AR events within our expanded value set. So this expanded value set contains around 900 additional SNOMED codes. These extra codes include species, subspecies, serotype, and serogroup, as well as the antimicrobial susceptibility terms that we currently don't capture. So 
for example, when folks ask us um, about specific SNOMED codes for, let's say, the E. coli serotypes that were identified by the lab, right now we have to say no, do not report them because we need to be able to give everyone the same clear guidance so that everyone is reporting um, from the same, same groups of pathogens. So this change is an effort to standardize which pathogens can be reported into NHSN. So I'll cover this a little bit more in the next slide, but we are not planning to add these 900 pathogen codes to the IDM for 2021, which means these specific SNOMED codes will not be accepted into NHSN. Instead, um, we'll be using what we're calling the AR pathogen roll-up workbook. So this workbook has already been posted in the AR CDA toolkit online, and we sent out an email with the workbook itself and a guidance document to all facilities submitting AR data as well as our vendor list um, a couple months ago now. This workbook will standardize all reporting across submitters, and the workbook lists the SNOMED codes as well as the fully specified names and the corresponding codes and names of the pathogens that should be rolled up to prior to being populated in the AR event CDA. So we'll go through a few examples on the next slide. So highlighted in row 144 here, if the lab reported the specific SNOMED code for the extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing E. coli or ESBL E. coli, that code is currently accepted by NHSN, so you would not have anything to roll up to, and you would report that specific SNOMED code in your AR event, as um, no roll-up would be done as evidenced by the NA in columns D and E. However, if the lab reported the code for multiple drug-resistant E. coli, or MDR E. coli, as shown in row 147, that code is not currently accepted by NHSN, but we would want you to roll it up and report it to NHSN using the regular E. coli code. So you would use columns D and E to know that you should report that as regular E. coli with the SNOMED code ending in 007. So as mentioned earlier, both the workbook and the reference guide that walks through some examples and kind of explains each column are already posted in the AR Option CDA toolkit that can be found on the toolkits page in, under the AUR section. If you have any questions about the workbook, please email the CDA help desk and we're happy to talk you through those. We do have two air option changes that will be delayed. Um, so they will be, they were originally planned for inclusion in this December release, but have been delayed until summer 2021 or NHSN release 10.0. Um, vendors and facilities should continue to use the R1 norm IG for reporting AR summary data. We will not be moving the AR IG to the R3 D4 IG as originally planned, but instead we'll wait and plan to use the new R4D1 IG, which will be undergoing ballot later, um, later this year. So for 10.0, we will be adding the ability to report no events within the AR option summary CDA. Right now, users can already report no AR events within the user interface. However, um, the IG will be updated to include a section for this um, within the AR summary record. Uh, similarly, we'll be adding the ability to report summary data from select outpatient locations for the AR option. So currently facilities report AR summary data for FACWIDEN only. This change would allow facilities to report summary data from the three outpatient location types of emergency department, pediatric emergency department, and 24-hour observation area. So then if those locations are in the reporting plan, facilities must upload both AR summary data and AR events if they have been identified. Again, that feature will be in the new IG. 
So next, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Heather. Thanks, Amy. So on the last quarterly CDA call, we mentioned that all non-urgent facility outreach was paused, and this was due to the ongoing COVID response activities. So this is just to let you know that as of mid-August, the AUR module has resumed high priority data quality outreach efforts. Um, please note that many of these initial efforts will require re-upload of data. Um, so as always, we'll continue to coordinate with vendors as possible through these outreach efforts. Uh, I plan to highlight a few of these outreach efforts in the slides to follow, but please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. The first outreach effort that I'll cover relates to AR events. Recently, we discovered two pathogen roll-up issues, which caused some events uploaded via CDA into the NHSN application to save as the incorrect pathogen. These specific issues are described in the excerpt from our facility outreach letter that's shown here. Briefly, um, ESBL Clubsdale Oxytoka events uploaded using the reference SNOMED code during July 18, 2019 to December 8, 2019 were incorrectly saved as the pathogen E. coli. And similarly, ESBL E. coli events uploaded using the reference SNOMED code during January 22nd, 2020 through March 19th, 2020, incorrectly saved as Klebsiella oxytoca. These defects have both been resolved. Because the roll-up happens before the data are saved in the application, uh, we're unable to determine which SNOMED was included in the original AR event CDA file, and therefore we flagged all uploaded events in the time period of the, with the pathogens of interest as potentially impacted. Facilities potentially impacted by these defects received instructions to review their events in the NHSN application and compare these events with their LIMS or EHR data. If errors were found, these events should be re-uploaded into the application to resolve the error. As you know, the NHSN antimicrobial use option recently added from Desivere, which is required in AU files starting in July 2020 and can be optionally included in AU files for summary months January through June 2020. We're closely monitoring reporting of Remdesivir for any data quality issues, and currently we are conducting outreach to two groups of facilities. The first group includes any facility that optionally reported Remdesivir for one or more inpatient locations in June of 2020, but did not include Remdesivir in their FACWIDE in file for June. The second group includes any facility that reported remdesivir for one or more inpatient locations for July of 2020, but did not submit a FACWIDE in file for July. We're asking that these facilities let us know if they do not plan to submit FACWIDE in data for the months in question, or to resubmit their FACWIDE in file so the data are accurately captured. A reminder about reporting NA versus zero antimicrobial days in AU summary file. Facilities should report zero antimicrobial days when no aggregate use occurred during a given reporting period for a specific antimicrobial agent route in a location where that agent route is used and can accurately be captured in the EMAR or BCMA system. Facilities should report NA or not applicable when data are not available for a specific antimicrobial agent route in a location. Antimicrobial agents and routes of administration cannot be left blank. The reason for this reminder is that in review of these data, we are seeing intermittent use of NA across antimicrobials at a greater frequency than anticipated. Analysis of the use of NA is in progress and will likely result in future data quality outreach. We're asking that you review your vendor practices regarding report of NA and update these practices as needed to ensure accurate capture of antimicrobial days. 
Secondly, work with your facilities to resubmit any data as needed. And then lastly, we ask that you communicate any findings to us to help us improve our data quality. Data quality outreach efforts will continue. Uh, just to highlight a few future outreach topics, um, these will include the use of NA within antimicrobial use summary files, discrepancies between AU, AR, and HAI denominator data, NHSN defects, outreach to facilities with missing AR susceptibility information, and outreach to facilities reporting use of a drug that is no longer commercially available. Thank you for your continued uh, efforts and collaboration as we work to ensure high quality AUR data. Um, for now, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Wendy. Hi, thanks, Heather. Um, so I'm Wendy Wise, uh, one of the uh, AUR module SMEs as well. Um, and also the point of contact for the synthetic data set uh, validation initiative. Uh, so I'm going to share information about the time, the, um, the um, AU SBS timeline, resources on our website, and uh, review the high level steps for submitting AU SBS for validation, uh, discuss the frequency of validation, review the CDA author section, and just a brief um, update on AR SBS. So we've shared the AUSDS timeline in the last several CDA webinar calls. As you can see, we are in the middle of validation phase in period with the AU uh, synthetic data set validation requirement just around the corner in 2021. We've had several vendors pass AUSDS validation. All verified vendors and their software are posted on the public facing NHSN webpage. This allows current and future customers to be aware of vendor services and successes with respect to the NHSN AU option validation. So please keep in mind that beginning in 2021, all AU CDA files that do not contain required SDS information will fail to import into NHSN. Here you can see the available resources and links to the website. The first one listed is our main webpage, um, and it has links to other resources. So I encourage you to start there, and if uh, it, you know, start there if you're new to AUSDS validation. On the next few slides, I'll share a screenshot of each and go into a little bit more detail um, on each of these. This slide has a screenshot of our main AUSDS validation webpage. This web page has the downloadable AU synthetic data set with instructions in the zip file. You'll notice that we just updated the data set in July with release 4.3. Vendors that passed validation prior to July of 2020 do not need to revalidate. Vendors that have not passed AUSDS yet need to use the 4.3 release. Please ensure you've downloaded those CSV or my uh, SQL formats as some of the tables have indeed changed. The structure is the same though. On the top right, the menu shows the other sections that are listed on the web page. The see also menu just below that has quick links to the other three topic areas that I'll show on the next few slides. Obtaining vendor OID webpage is fairly self-explanatory, but uh, please note that we are asking that you also copy the NHSN CDA at cdc.gov mailbox on this request. Also note that vendor OID is sometimes referred to as the vendor application OID. Vendor OID is different and unique from the facility OID. The vendor OID is assigned by FinTech and is unique for each vendor. This has raised some questions recently, so let me state this another way as well. A vendor OID does not replace the facility OID. The NHSN application uses the facility OID to identify the facility in each CDA file so that the data can be uploaded into the appropriate NHSN facility. NHSN uses the vendor OID to track the SDS validation status of vendors and their software. Both OIDs will be needed on the AU CDA files. 
So please continue to include facility OID as you have been doing in that section of the AU CDA. Now, jumping back to the, the email to FinTech. So in response to your email to FinTech, you will receive a vendor OID. I've noticed that they're um, pretty quick. The turnaround time on these requests are fairly quick within a week or so. So just to re reiterate, this vendor OID will be required in the author section of the AU CDA once a vendor passes AU SDS validation. We currently have 23 AU SDS related FAQs. I highly encourage you to review those FAQs at the beginning of embarking on AUSCS validation and even throughout the process. Uh, some things might not click um, right away until you're further along in the AUSCS validation process, but having the FAQs handy can help answer questions as they pop up for you. The last web page I want to share is the vendors that have passed the AUSDS validation. As you can see from this screenshot, we have a table which includes the vendor name, including a hyperlink to the vendor's website that the vendor can optionally provide us, as well as the vendor name, version of release, uh, I'm sorry, vendor software name, version of release, and the date the vendor passed validation. The table is organized alphabetically. So uh, as new vendors pass AUSDS, they'll be inserted in alphabetically. I also want to point out the certification badge. We'll email you that badge once you successfully complete AUSDS validation. You can feel free to include this badge on your website or vendor material once your software has been validated. This slide shows at a very high level the steps to take for completing AUSDS validation. You first should download the AU synthetic data set in the accompanying instructions, and I've included the link on this slide. After thoroughly reading the instructions document, I would also recommend reviewing the AUSDS FAQs, like I mentioned previously, to gain additional information or help answer some common questions that uh, you might have as you read through the instructions document. We'll include the link here again. So in general, though, you should process the AU synthetic data set through your vendor's system just like you would with regular facility AU data. You should aggregate the data following the AUR module protocol for the AU option. However, for AU SDS validation, the output should be in the Excel format so that we can confirm you've aggregated the AU data properly. So just remember, AU SDS validation is intended for use in testing numerator and denominator data aggregation. It's not for conforming, conformance to CDA AU reporting. So then next, you would upload the file to the NHSN SDS validation web service that will validate your aggregated AU data against an answer key. Uh, this last step of your uh, internal testing can be done as many times as needed to check that your aggregated data um, is correct against the answer key. So one important note about the NHSN validation web service. Um, it has come to our attention that vendor systems have varying capabilities for capturing all drugs and all routes. If your system is not capable of reporting blank or null values for some of the routes of administration while reporting values for other routes, for example, reporting null for penicillin-5 respiratory route while reporting numeric values for the remaining routes, then please use this first link to validate your SDS file. If your system can report blank or null values for some of the routes, and while reporting numerical values for others, please use the second link to validate your SDS file. So just to recap, you only need to submit and test against one of these URLs, not both. It really depends on your specific situation as described on this slide. The NHSN team, we do need to know which URL you use for testing, as you will see on the, the next slide when I explain it further. So once ready, uh, send, the NHSN, send the NHSN team the AU summary Excel file in order to receive confirmation of successful AUSDS validation. 
In addition, the Excel file, and as part of the vendor registration process, please include the following additional information. The vendor OID, your vendor name, uh, vendor software name, vendor software version or release, and at least one technical point of contact, as well um, the SDS validation web service URL that you use for testing. And then optionally, if you would like to include your vendor website, um, we will make sure that's linked on the passing vendor uh, web page as well. If any of the information is missing, apart from the optional vendor website uh, URL, we will not process your request. After we receive your information, we are also following up via email asking if you'd like us to delay posting your vendor software information on the passing vendor's website. Uh, some of you shared with us that you may want to incorporate the SDS validation ID into your software system and would like time to do that and hence have us delay posting your vendor information to the public facing website, which is fine and we're doing that, um, it's not a problem. At this point, providing we've received the required information, we will test your Excel file to confirm it passes AUSDS validation. So if the Excel file passes, an email will be sent containing the SDS validation ID to, to be added to your production AUCDA files. Additionally, the vendor name, software name, software version, will be published to our public facing webpage to highlight successful AU SDS validation. If that Excel file fails, an email will be sent indicating that the file failed and it will list the errors received or a subset if there are a lot of errors. You can then resume testing internally, uploading your AU summary Excel file to the NHSN web service tool as many times as needed uh, to, to then not receive any more errors. So once ready again, follow the same steps as outlined in the previous slide for submitting the AU summary Excel file to us to confirm the file passes AUSDS. Well, one of the most frequently asked questions we get from y'all is uh, about, uh, about this initiative is how often to validate. The AUSDS validation process is expected to be completed once per vendor per software version. So starting in 2021, all vendors creating AU CDA files will need to have successfully passed the initial AU SDS validation in order for their AU CDA files to be either manually uploaded or imported via direct into NHSN. No vendor will be grandfathered in. Uh, all client facilities using the same software version will have the exact same information in the author fields of the AU summary CDAs. The NHSN team requires you to recomplete the AU SDS validation process only when major changes have been made to the AU option protocol. And we'll let you know that. Uh, you should also complete the revalidation process when major changes are made to your software that understandably might affect the AU summary data aggregation. Next, I'd like to show the author section of the AU CDA and the expectations for including the SDS vendor information. This slide shows an example of the XML coding of the author field. The ID root highlighted here must contain your vendor OID. The extension highlighted here must contain the SDS validation ID. As a reminder, the SDS validation ID will be provided by us, the NHSN team, to you after confirmation of successful AU SDS validation. So vendor name, vendor software name, vendor version and release are currently optional fields, but having this information will streamline the troubleshooting of issues. So we appreciate if you do include it. I have one more item to share today. Uh, you, if we, we are still working on creating the antimicrobial resistance synthetic data set and hope to have a beta release soon. If you would like to participate in the pilot phase of ARSDS, please send an email to the mailbox, nhsncda at cdc.gov, indicating your interest. So 
In closing, I'd just like to emphasize that should you have any questions about AUSDS validation or even ARSDS validation, to please not hesitate to email us at nhsncda at cdc.gov. And thanks for your time today. All right, thanks, Wendy. Um, my next slides will cover upcoming changes for the dialysis component, release 9.5 and 10.0. Right, starting with CR 2523, 2524, and 2367, these are for CDA catch-up in adding the date fields to the three specific events in dialysis. The 21-day rule will be updated, so it will compare each event's specific event date with the other event's specific event date. In other words, it will look at each date individually instead of using the overall event date. The overall event date will be used in scenarios where the specific event date is null for 2020 or prior. Additionally, dialysis event CDA version will be updated from the R3D1.1 IG to R3D4 IG. Any dialysis events with the date 2021 or greater will use the new R3D4 CDA. Supplemental documents can be found in the 9.5 CDA toolkit. Next slide. CR 2536 is a child CR from patient safety where the updates are being made to the HAI pathogen susceptibility data uh, collection form. This update again will be valid for dates 2021 or greater. Please be sure to use the anti-B9.5 tab for any events uh, dated 2021 or greater. Next slide. Right here on this slide, uh, you can it covers the compatibility changes occurring in 9.5 only for dialysis. Dialysis events will be updated to the R3D4 implementation guide starting in 2021. Next slide. Next, I'll cover some uh, updates for the biovigilance component for 9.5. CR 2517 is for the annual update to the ISBT values. The updated list is posted on our website under the toolkits for release 9.5. Next slide. Again, we just have one update for the neonatal component. Next slide. Um, as mentioned earlier, we originally had this planned uh, for summer 2020, but with all the new COVID-19 uh, changes and updates, this has been pushed out to summer 2021 um, in our 10.0 release. Please review the R3D4 implementation guide. There will be only CDA and no user interface for late onset sepsis meningitis uh, events and denominator. Next slide. All right, the next slide will be regarding the new functionality created for NHSN and vendors. Next slide. As a reminder, vendor services is currently available for vendors to request their facilities location data. Nothing new is required to use this service as all requests and responses are handled via direct CDA automation. Facilities do have the option to opt out of using this service. Please visit the link for information on how to use uh, vendor services. Next slide. All right, next we'll cover up some miscellaneous updates in NHSN. This slide here displays uh, the number of percentages of CDA imports versus manual entry or CSV imports for procedures. The year date range was selected to include completed quarterly CMS reporting. Please note the steady increase in the CDA submission. We would like to express our gratitude to all of our vendors and users. Uh, next slide. A quick update for direct CDA automation. Uh, we are at 20 vendors submitting via direct. The number of facilities sending via direct has been increasing and is now greater than 7,000 facilities. NHSN is constantly working to improve this service and looking to streamline the process, and we have made significant upgrades for direct. Uh, for those of you who don't use direct yet, it is a batch submission process with no immediate reply. Uh, turnaround time is typically based on volume of messages in the queue. Um, if you are new to Direct or want to learn more, there is a Direct Toolkit on our NHSN website. Before you start your process, we do recommend that you schedule a call with us, um, and we'll be happy to discuss uh, any Direct processes and recommend uh, best practices. 
We will have a developer and a direct administrator join the call for a technical discussion. Next slide. Right, and CDA support is available on the NHSN website. Um, the first link is to the main CDA submission support portal. Um, other important links provided on this slide are to the CDA toolkits and guide to CDA versions. Um, and just a reminder, NHSN supports CDA versions that are valid for the past two years. Next slide. A few more helpful resources can be found at the following links. The first one is NHSN newsletter. Um, the next link is for release notes and communication updates. And the last is the defect list and release schedule. Next slide. All right, moving into NHSN pre-production test site or NPPT. Um, again, this is available to all vendors. NPPT allows vendors to test their code in uh, NHSN prior to deployments. To request a test site, please follow the instructions on this slide and send the completed forms to the CDA team. Next slide. When logging into NPPT, please read the important message at login. We will be starting our beta testing for release 9.5 in October. Once this beta testing period is completed, NPPT will be updated to release 9.5 and vendors will be able to start testing their new CDA updates. Again, the time frame is late October, early November. Once this uh, NPPT has been updated to 9.5, we will send out an email. Um, and uh, once you guys start testing, please uh, send us any issues that you find in your testing to the NHSN uh, CDA at cdc.gov. Next slide. All right, future CDAs coming in 2021 uh, will be for long-term care. Um, LTC is currently working on lab ID and UTI. Uh, once more information becomes available, it will be shared with all vendors. We also are work planning to have CDA for outpatient procedure component. OPC will include an event and denominator for same day outcome measures, a new SSI event, and a new denominator for procedure. Next slide. As always, we welcome any feedback. If you are not on the CDA distribution email, please let us know. The CDA team is also offering one-on-one -on -one quarterly meeting with vendors. Send an email to the CDA inbox if you have not had a chance to schedule a call with us and would like to. Please include any topics of discussion so the correct team is on the call. Next slide. All right, and this concludes our September 2020 CDA presentation. We'll go ahead and stop the recording now and give a few minutes to everyone to ask questions. Um, you can go ahead and use the Q&A box, um, and if not, you can always send us an email, and we'll be ha uh, happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thanks.